Excellent. So, um, yeah, thank you for taking the time. That, that's good. Uh, this is uh, exactly the kind of documents we want to generate in terms of the building documents so everyone can replicate. So, yeah, that's right on. So I should. Right. So, um, I think it, it was interesting what you said about trying to pair up with entrepreneurs to, I'll say, kind of do the permit processing. I, I think that's a, a good idea. Um, I think if people are willing to learn uh, drafting software, it, it's very doable. It's not rocket science. Um, but if that is not their cup of tea, um, getting someone to basically finish off a 80 to 90% complete set shouldn't be that expensive. You know, um, mm -hmm. you don't have to hire a, an architect. You can get a drafts person. Um, and uh, yeah. so it's not, um, this is not, this is basically as simple as it gets in terms of something you need a building permit for. And I think if we can prepare the way and say, okay, here's your typical foundation details. Here's your typical yep. connection details. Here's your typical roof details. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to be left are the customization. So mm -hmm. they're going to have to do a little site plan that is unique to their property. Um, they will have to do any specific things that are unique to their jurisdiction. So yeah. um, for California, you're going to have to do what's called a Title 24 report. It's for energy compliance. Um, some cities have their own you know, little bells and whistles they'll want you to do. And that's kind of an impossible to plan for um, yeah. in terms of exactly what it is. But if you can get uh, a boilerplate set that is kind of fill in the blank spots, that's going to ease your way through the plan check process yeah. immensely. Um, and what's really nice about these those ADU sets uh, is that they're they're basically opening it up um, yeah. to everyone, and so um, typically I think you'd be hard pressed to find a non-copyrighted version mm -hmm. of all those notes, all those details. And now, you know, for instance, I couldn't share my firm's standard notes with you in good conscience. Like right. those are copyrighted proprietary stuff. I would get in trouble. Um, but. County of San Diego just gave it to us for free. Yeah, so yeah, no, that's yeah. that's really good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the distinction between architect and draftsperson, that's right. And the way we're looking at it is, we want to have tr like the whole package we're trying to set up is education at all levels. So here you get the just the craft craftsperson, the builder. Here's you. You might have a thing. I was looking at the design track, which you now made the distinction between architecture and draft drafting. So somewhere mm -hmm. in between it, but we can get into that in our education and another track for the entrepreneurial route, which is more about here's how you would run a business doing this. So yes, we want to cover like we're looking at like um, my mind is kind of reframing. This is literally like a tech school. And the higher levels of this tech school would be, okay, so say you take the th first three months, which is about just the technical details of building and carpentry. Uh, along with that, you can take the track for uh, design, the drafting, or mm -hmm. close to architecture, like uh, we right. can't, can't call it architecture, but we could call it something else. Um, and then people, other people can continue on to ongoing training after that, which would be more towards, okay, here's the OSC training for collaborative literacy. Here's how you actually would start up an operation based on OSC work and so forth. So yeah, it could be a continuum uh, starting with, like with a tech school idea. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Is it, um, yeah, the, the drafting bit, you know, this is kind of best case scenario for drafting. The, there's not a lot of high-end coordination, difficult stuff that these are, you know, walls and walls and joists. Yeah. Uh, this is a nice, easy building here. You're, you're not trying to figure out how an elevator works in this thing. You know, it, this is doable. You know, um, yeah. So, one one thing I had started looking into some open source drafting programs. Um, mm. What? Uh, 
So the issue is that I'm used to working in a suite of very, very expensive, very, very proprietary stuff. What are they called? Um, what do you, what the professionals use? So I use something called Autodesk Revit. Okay. Uh, and it is a three dimensional um, BIM program. Um, so it is, I'd say that's kind of top tier, mostly industry standard for architecture. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you do not need to do this building in 3D. Um, a, a 2D program would suffice yeah. wonderfully. For Let me show you this. Let me actually um, share my screen with you. But we are generating like. Uh, let me let me share. Um, I want to show you what we're doing on that front because actually between Sweet Home 3D and FreeCAD, we're getting a full set of 3D CAD on this. So, okay. um, just want to show you just for reference. So let me see where is the screen share. Share the screen. Uh, share. So take a look at. So we have our Seed Home 2 3D CAD. So I am actually doing. Let me open up a file for you. Then, like, say yeah. you take the window, the eight foot window, here um, on the desktop, and then open up the CAD. Um, so I am actually doing doing stuff like this where I'm actually getting a full BOM generation from this because every so I can hide this all the details like like the all the details are there like okay so, um, so actually so, seam okay flashing I'm just stripping it down we've got the insulation in there I even got things like details like the that's a represent placeholder for the <clears throat> the sill tape. I'm actually gonna use this corner, like the uh, those corners on the bottom on the detail, like the drip cap, like all of that. So the way this is, I'm doing this here is in a part tree. Everything is itemized, so I, I run a little script that generates me a full, actually a complete summed up bill of materials from this. So we are getting That's into hot. this, and then. Uh, Katarina on her side, she's got, uh, let me open up Sweet Home 3D. So we do have, um, let me see. So Sweet Home 3D. So just to show you what the open source uh, industry standards are here, but in Sweet Home 3D, now I can open up. Yeah, so this is our model in, in Sweet Home where we also likewise have the ability to do the full you know, the full thing so Katarina is actually doing this as a technical model so actually the parts in here even though this is more like an interior design program um, like all the things in here are actually technically cor technically correct with the proper um, um, yeah if you look in there like this is your kitchen like this kind of like what you uh, right but um the dimensions are in there so this is actually technically quite correct and uh, between the two like for example when you saw this so the the girl in there and uh, let's see the this like this thing here that's a rendering from the inside so we've got this kind of a capacity like right now uh, to do so that. Um, let me open up something on my end um, Um, so, that, first of all, that, that's awesome. I think that's that's very cool, uh, and I think that will help uh, people, particularly that aren't used to looking at formalized building plans, really understand things. And I think particularly the kind of free CAD, really nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. When you're, you'll be showing you know, how to actually put it together, how to build it in a yeah. much more robust way than typical building plans. So, you know, typical building plans are meant for professional builders. So if I show a section and show how the flashing goes, I assume the person putting the flashing on has done this for 10 years. Mm -hmm. They know how to put in flashing. If I show it where it is, that's enough. Mm -hmm. You don't get that assumption. You've got to assume you're working with newbies. Um, yep. And so they're going to do a lot more, which I think is 
great to have that kind of level of detail. But uh, and this is a question, can either of them uh, still provide what I'd call documentation? So uh, yes, you've got 3D model, but if I need to turn in dimensioned floor plans or sections to the building department, can you get me a PDF with those details cranked out of those programs? That's what I was having trouble kind yeah. of really yeah. seeing how to set up a sheet with details. The way I understand it, the best way to do it in an open source tool chain is there's Inkscape. So that's okay. the only thing. So that's, um, let me share my screen again here. But so. Yeah. So Inkscape is your vector graphics program. Okay. Um, so let's see, and we were getting into like looking at how people are using Inkscape potentially for architecture. Um, but let me show you another link here on my log. It's about free. Let's see, free CAD sweet home free blender. No, let's see. So let's look at Inkscape for for architecture. Yeah, like what we want to do is so let's open this one. Inkscape, Hatchville patterns in Inkscape, Inkscape one hundred one. Okay, so things like my like symbols library usable for, but but I mean what you're talking about is really okay. Here's a yeah full PDF. I see it as Google Docs, all the graphics from Inkscape, and uh, whatever we can get out of FreeCAD. There's some BIM capacity, and let me show you what's available in. Um, out of Blender, there's people, there's actually a BIM plugin for Blender. Um, so let me see, BIM, Blender, Park Library is Blender one, Blender Animation, Well, let's see what we got. Um, where is this BIM stuff? No. Yeah. So I have to look at um, so it. I've bumped into Inkscape before, but purely is just kind of vector, you know. Okay, um, so this this kind of stuff. So, yes. So that, exactly that stuff. Um, yeah, so. So how is this done here? This is, uh, this is from FreeCAD Forum, and this has been generated out of FreeCAD and <clears throat> some Inkscape, I believe. OK. And this is Blender BIM add-on demo, like section plans. Mm -hmm. right, you put this into section Blender. Section plane button. This will create a new so empty object sections. at the 3D cursor location. Right. view. Click the remove section plane button. Yeah, so this kind of stuff. Yeah, again, that's <laughs> that looks like overkill for us, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, so that was my concern. Of, um, we've got it. Kind of got two parallel tracks. One is what you were showing, really, to get it, uh, you know, takeoffs, showing people how it's built, etc. But mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. you know. You, this package should probably only be a few sheets total for getting through the plan check process. Um, so, okay. it, so question here. So the full package, yeah. like for example, for the Encinitas example, that's not what you submit for the building package, or that is. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that would do it. So that's got. Um, 
that had mechanical electrical on it as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, um, uh, but you'll see that their details for construction are not, you know, uh, very instructive. They're just, this is what we're doing. Um, so what I, what I see is you having that to check your boxes, get your permit, but then a much more robust kind of library to explain to people actually how to build this. Um, they are, you know, uh, intermeshed in terms of usefulness, but um, here, can I share my screen? Yeah, yeah. So I, I just went to the Encinas website, so maybe, um, yeah, so it's like the answer is we need all of that stuff, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, um, so this is just a random project that I have. Um, but so we have, you know, the fancy dancy model, but at the end of the day, what actually gets turned in are um, just very basic yep. sheets with notes mm -hmm, and things. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this doesn't have the details sheets on it, but mm -hmm. like, all sections. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it, it's, you know, you're just showing bits and pieces. So it, it's good for good enough for a professional builder, but not necessarily for a first time builder. Yeah, and just um, as a note, uh, the model that we're doing is, uh, here's we're presenting that for novice builders, but also like we have documentation that the pro can take it and just run with it as well. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. The, I, I, to that extent, I would ask the question, um, why would a pro do your system well, okay, so here's the, here's the use case. So we, we provide a package for people to build, and they have a number of options on their plate. They can say, mm -hmm. I'm going to take the OSC course, uh, go in for a few weeks of the summer, learn the basic skills. If, if someone feels confident enough, they can actually build it completely themselves. But the other thing is, what the way we're looking at it is, we don't think that most people will be in a position to do the work themselves. That the DIY market, we can fairly say that that market will be much smaller than a person who will hire others to do it. So how do you get others to do it? Well, one, you can send them to our course and they can build for you, or you can give this the set of plans to a contractor or a builder or you basically, the, the person who took our course, uh, knows enough about it to kind of manage to build themselves, but they're hiring people to do that. And we want to enable them to, to go to professionals, like say, here's a foundation contract or, or a carpenter, right. and also do that as well. So we want to make that possible and easy for all these different routes of execution. I, that makes sense to me. I, I think my one one concern would be the the panelization yeah. is very slick. If you're going to be you know building panels yourself or having a team yeah. build panels individually, yeah. But if you can hire a framer, just have them frame a wall. It's going to be cheaper and easier, you know. Um, so that I worry about that. I, I think it's a great asset to be able to kind of break down your building into smaller manageable chunks but if you have the ability to hire a framer uh, you'll have less studs less effort less tie downs just a conventionally framed wall mm -hmm. all the other efficiencies that you guys have worked out you know are really dialed in you know um utility chase things like that yeah still totally viable mm -hmm. But if I were hiring a framer, I wouldn't mess with the panelization. If I were doing it myself, I think it's an awesome idea. But if I were hiring a framer, frame a wall. They know how to do it. It's cheap. Um, yeah. And just something to keep on. Yeah, yeah. No, we're, 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 we're definitely thinking about that. And what we want to do is we want to actually show side by side, this is the data from each route in terms of cost mm -hmm. and time and effort and skill required. So that's probably something we will do in the summer session, which is going to be in September of this year. Because oh, right now we're just building, we're currently building the house right here, right now, using the panelized model and getting all the data from that. 
we're yep. going to do another one. It looks like what we're going to be doing is another one in Texas where it's warm and we can actually go there like next month or something and do it, but also replicate to see if this, this data that we got here is replicable. And then we'll, after that, so, so that's like the main package, the panelized construction, which allows the owner builder to do that. And of course right. you can still hire people you're saying that it might be more expensive as opposed to regular framing, but we actually want to take that data point, like get really rigorous data on that. Okay, what exactly is the cost? How much difference is it? Is it yeah. like 5%? Is it 50%? Uh, right. So people have the full informed choice of how to do it. Yeah. I, I, as long as you're aware of it, I think that's, yeah. yeah, going with your eyes open to that one. Yeah. Um, yep, yep. Yeah, because that's Cause, a yeah, critique. Framing you know, a 20 foot wall is super intimidating for a one or two person, you know, team. But yeah. framing a four by eight panel, much, you know, much yeah. more doable. Yeah, exactly. And and there's also the issue of resistance from the industry. Like people, uh, the industry, standard people, they're gonna be like, no, we're not gonna build your panels. Like right now, I actually think because of the way. Um, no, I mean, I, I can't I can't make any solid predictions, but but all I can say is that we also know that there's just an, a resistance like you won't be able to get some carpenters to do. It. They're going to just tell you like, no, this is ridiculous, <laughs> perhaps. So <laughs> you have to be ready for that. I, I agree. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think they would be confused for sure. Yeah, at, at very least. <laughs> like, why are you doing that? Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I think your goal, and I think you've succeeded, is not to be a one-trick pony. The panelizations yeah. is nice, but there's a lot of other, you know, well thought out bits of it too. So have those in there. So, you know, it's not, it's not like oh, this is worthless if you don't do panelization. Um, right. So, back to the, the CAD thing. So the one thing I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll look into Inkscape. Um, so my worry was basically, um, uh, let me just pull up a PDF, doing something with dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what's that? There are still open source 2D CAD programs, like there's one called... Yeah, so I was looking at LibreCAD. Yeah, that, LibreCAD. Uh, that seemed to be kind of what I was seeing as um, the most straightforward, at least in 2D. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. Where I want to go with this is typically you are doing um, details um, to a certain scale. Mm -hmm. And that scale is going to change. Um, oops, I just opened up a bunch of stuff based on something. So, you know, this is how to do uh, a door header at this particular thing. And this is at uh, a scale three inches equals a foot. Mm -hmm. um, but on that same page... And this is a printout? Okay. Or is this a... Yeah, so this, this is a PDF uh, that I'm looking at now. But this is, comes as a direct export from that program called Revit. Mm -hmm. um, but the the way most of the I'll say more professional software works um, uh, is there's kind of two layers. There's the drafting view where you're really drafting, and then a a sheet view. And that sheet view allows you to put things at different scales. Mm -hmm. So I can set this detail at one and a half inches equals a foot, mm -hmm. and the detail beside it at six inches equals a foot. And the detail beside it at three quarters inch equals. Yeah. So depending on which way, and that that I don't know if we can. Uh, when I was looking at Libregat, it had some stuff, but it was. It, it seemed like you could set up a title block for one size sheet of paper, and then set your scale at one thing, but it wouldn't give you the flexibility. Um, and that gets a little tricky in that for one job, mm -hmm. you'd at least want a few different scales. So you would want to scale for your site plan, your floor plans, and then maybe you got were really good and did all your details at three inches equals a foot, which is probably the most common. 
but now you're now you're having to mess with three different or four different title blocks mm -hmm. on different titles. It, it seemed far from ideal. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Librecast setup is great for if you are drafting up a, a part, you know, your little widget, yeah. and you have one of those, good. But when you've got a building, and you know, this is mm -hmm. for what we need, but you're nonetheless going to have, you know, a dozen sheets or so with different drawings on them. So mm -hmm. I want to look into it. I will look into Inkscape again. I haven't looked at that for architecture. So I'll see, but I'd love to kind of recommend something to you of like, hey, this is this is the route I would do. Yeah. Because ideally, what you can do is you give everyone a a PDF copy of this, but also an editable copy. And so they can change the title block to put in, you know, name of their project, where it's addressed, yada yada. Um, and then they can tweak things, but at least you get them a boilerplate. Yeah. Um, and and that that would be very handy, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't I don't know what to tell you quite yet in terms of what, um, what makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, I'll look at I'll I'll try to do some digging. Um, what are the image formats here? Like, is this working? Is Revit working with scalable v vector graphic formats or just like straight to PDF? Yeah. So the, uh, well, um, it is straight to PDF, but um, basically the way Revit works is you, you model things in true one-to-one -one scale. So, um, so I'll pull this on. So this is a window uh, and it's 60 by 60. If I change that, it truly would change to be a different size. But then you have what are called views. So this is the real model. That's mm -hmm. what I'm actually modeling. But then I take views of it. So I can take an elevation and basically take a picture of it from the side and then add annotations onto it so I can do sections or color callouts or yada yada. Those views are then placed on sheets at a certain scale. So mm -hmm. this, yeah. this is kind of a view uh, that is independent. And then I literally drag and drop it onto this sheet that is this title block is set up to print for a archie one size paper so it's um 30 by 42 inch size paper mm -hmm. um so we everything goes to pdf but the pdf is it's it's is a it is vectored you know you can zoom in on this all you want um uh, but you no one you're not editing these um uh, as um, as line work, the details you can edit as line work, but again, it's back in Revit. Um, so Revit has a full kind of detailing suite. Um, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can do all sorts of lines or patch regions and stuff, um, mm -hmm. and they're all obviously dimensioned. So you can make this two inches exactly, and we got it. Um, but I think the trick will be trying to get the best usability um, uh, out of the, the open source options we've got. So we'll, what I'm not seeing is that kind of dual system where you have the sheet views and the, um, the actual model stuff. And so... Uh, let me see if I have it. The thing, I, yeah, here. So this is what I exported for you. Um, this will take a second to load. But um, it is, they have the editable file, but it's it's not, I'll say, amateur friendly. Um, I'll show you what I mean in a second. But again, AutoCAD does the same thing. They have kind of the model view and then the sheet views. Mm -hmm. And that is um, so. Here, um, let me just tell you real yeah. quick what is available. If you look at my screen, uh, let me share my screen for a sec. Yeah. Back. 
So the only thing that we do have is this. This is out of FreeCAD. You can do this. Uh, you can extract dimensional, you can draw these arrows and you can have all the different isometric views. Um, this is for a part. Um, so that's the only transition between you got your 3D CAD and then your, your 2D cross sections and things. Yeah. So, um, I'll look into it. I think that's possible. What, what that limits you though is one, one scale yep. per sheet. Right. Uh, whoa. <laughs> Just went into yeah. infinity right yeah. there. Um, so no, that's, that's right. That, there is no tool that I know of right now that can do that. What you're saying. Let me, let me try to share my screen again. Um, mm -hmm. So this is that the do you see right here how this kind of looks like gobbly glue because it's overlapping. Mm -hmm. What they've done is you can filter things based off of um, the layers. So you can turn some layers off and some layers on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so this is the model. This is the actual drafting. But then they have a floor plan view. And in this view, so this is a view right here I've just highlighted. In that view, they turn off all the ceiling stuff, all the electrical mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and so same thing is that they're, they can have these different views to include the door and schedule where um, it looks like in FreeCAD and I think in LibreCAD as well, the, all, this, all this basically has to be on the same, in the same place. And so it's going to be at the same scale. Yeah. Um, but that is not the end of the world. Um, but it's, it gets a little tricky. Um, eventually, though, um, what we can do is just walk through this. And I'd be more than happy to do this. Basically, just highlight and cross out the things that you need and things you don't. So um, uh, a lot of these are needed. Uh, but some of them, like this is just trying to be the end all for everything. If you have a roll and shower, all these notes, like, well, you don't probably don't need that uh, for a lot of things. Um, uh, can you send a link to this to this PDF that you have right now? That, it, wait, that's, that's, no, that's yours. So that that's the um, that's the CAD file. I tried to export it as a DXF because the IFC wasn't working for you. Have yeah. you been able to open them? No, the but what I don't wasn't know, working either. Yeah, so, so the problem is you should be able to get um, the model. You should be able to get this, but what I doubt you're going to be able to get, which is kind of the cleaner, neater version of everything, are the layouts. So you don't have these layout tabs. Um, and so this gets you a lot more info. Um, but that being said, you still have the PDFs, uh, so you can still cut and paste the text, which is really probably the most useful thing, uh, is one, I'd say, a guide to, OK, this is this is basically what you'll need to get uh, permitted. Um, so this level of detail, you can see it, it's not much. Like, you don't, nothing crazy. Yeah. Um, like this, like this. This is very California specific. You're not going to need that in 98 percent of your project, so don't worry about that. Um, but you, you probably are going to need attic ventilation calculations. Or actually, no, you guys are doing unvented attic, so scratch that. But oh, wait. Need, uh, check regarding this out. Your actually, uh, so I just opened LibreCAD, and LibreCAD does open up your your file. Excellent. It can, but FreeCAD doesn't, but LibreCAD does. So I do have that, and it does appear to have layers, so that's good. Um, Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so the way we're 
you, so with Revit, you have the automated workflow for that. The, I mean, the only thing we can do right now, and that's why we're actually going to do the the hackathon that we're working on, and that is get a group of people working on it together in a live editable doc, so that one person or few people are not mm -hmm. working on a master CAD and then doing it all themselves. We can have a large team using multiple tools and then coordinate that into a live editable, crowd editable doc. So if you have a basic level of understanding of how that all goes together, yeah, you can you can do it. Um, it's a swarm kind of base method. Tell me a little bit more about how, say you have your MasterCAD in Revit. Mm -hmm. How many people, how do you divide the workflow in there? Is it possible to also work as a <clears throat> group of designers on it or what are the limits to that? And things so like in Revit, yes. Um, Revit has what's called work sharing, and um, but it is it, it's very Revit specific. But basically, they have what's called a central file, and that is hosted somewhere. Um, for our company, it's on a server, but you can also have cloud hosting. Um, and when you you want to start working on the file. Um, you open the file, but what you're doing is not necessarily entering into the central file. Mm -hmm. You're creating a local copy. So yeah. when you open the file, you create a local copy on your, your workstation. You then begin to work on that. But as you work on something, so say I click on this window and I want to change that window. Oh, you can't see me, but um, you can imagine. So I click on that window. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in essence, check out that window. Yep. Um, and so as soon as I click on it, an instantaneous little ping goes from my computer to the central model that says, Elijah now owns this window. And anyone else in the model can no longer click on that window. It's, uh, it's locked for them. So I'm messing with that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, once I'm done doing whatever I was doing, uh, I click up here and go synchronize with central. And what that does is it uploads and downloads. So any of the changes I make get pushed to the central file. And at the same time, any changes that other people have already pushed to the central get re-downloaded to my model. Yep. And so we, we sync up. Um, it gets tricky when there's a lot of people on it. Uh, generally, we try to keep our teams to like, let's say, five-ish or so. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm trying to sync and you're trying to sync at the same time, you will get errors and it'll say central model is busy. Um, yep. That being said, that this program's like several thousand dollars a seat per year. Um, I don't know if you're gonna get anywhere near that functionality from any free open source option. like. That that's a pretty high level functionality to expect from an open source program, in yeah. my opinion. Mom. So, uh, I think maybe you you can back it up a step, and you know there is maybe a everybody's drafting on their own, but they are then uploading their final detail up to a you know. Um, editable live document or something. But I think it's going to be tricky to be all in the same model at the same time. Yeah, actually, um, so the way, let me show you my screen and show you how we do it right now. So you can get a reference point and uh, where is my share screen? So let's go, say, for example, to this Seed Home 2 CAD. So what is feasible, we just get this visual part library. So the actual files are here. So the idea is you take your, your house and break it up into known modules. So you do the module breakdown, and you have to declare that up front. And then you can have... A number of people like here you have say 10 modules so 10 people can work on each module and then what we like to have is a coordinator who who would look at what everyone's working on and as and let's get get you an example so you go into the eight foot window here 
So, well, let's not take a look at that one. Let's take one that's got a longer history. Like, for example, this one, it's got a whole version history. So we're not logging any file. We're saying, okay, anybody who wants to work on this, go ahead. And we do reconciliation or merge conflict resolution at the very end. So you can have a thousand people working on this file the single file, they can just all be uploading and you can make some comments and notes as far as what you've done. You know where the part fits all together in a, in a final doc, uh, but a lot of people are able to work together. And the idea is that the first thing you do, you just simply look at the version history and you see like, okay, has anyone done work on top of my file or is there another compelling version to, to look at? And right. you can do that by uh, here we don't have a visual history, but through a visual history, like as you go working forward, you, you kind of take little snapshots of where, it, where you're at and what maybe like say point to a change that was made. So it's visible. It's, it's a visual history and then people can build on it. But, but we never lock anything down. It's an open process, but at the end of the day, it can make sense because uh, a person who's in charge of the whole model can make the final reconciliations. And the way, um, why we do that, there's... That a lot, that you, you do what manually Revit does, but you, somebody at the end of the day can still say, okay, I need yeah. X, Y, and add them together. Yeah, yeah you, you still have to have that reconciliation step at the very end. And um, as long so, as... Uh, I, yeah, what so I, it's, it's, not, it's not an ideal process, but it's, it's kind of works for No, I... Yeah. Uh, let me play with FreeCAD a little bit. Um, so this could work really, really well for details, in my opinion, that you break it down. You know, There's probably two dozen, three dozen details you'll need yeah. all together. Mm -hmm. um, have those all be separate items. Don't have it as a, yep. in the same file. Yeah. yeah. Everybody works on those, et cetera. Uh, but then uh, what I need to look at is, is there a easy or feasible way to, at the end of the day, take all of those individual, you know, uh, drafted details and put them together on one piece of paper um, in a, you know, efficient manner. As long as there's a, a reasonable way to add them together, I think that makes a lot of sense. Divvy it up because, again, you, depending on what you decide to do, Maybe you're doing one story, so you don't need any of your stair details. So it doesn't really make sense to include those. So you can just go and click, say, okay, I need to download this, 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 and this. And then you just basically arrange them on a sheet. Um, yeah, I can see that working really well. Um, maybe there's a guide sheet of like, hey, this is what you typically need, but then you go kind of gather them yourself. or um, That's... It's a very interesting system. Yeah, I mean, uh, I like the concept is that you're um, you allow for an infinite number of forks. Really, the idea yeah. is because you don't really know how something will work in practice. It's never really finished, and and this is all the master CAD file. You can't really say that until you prototype it. So, the people who do the prototyping would have the merit or authority to say, oh, "Okay, now we tested this." Like, say here, we do the build here. We say, we took this module, we tested it, we built the assembly, we tested it, and this works for us. Now we can say, okay, this is the MasterCAD file. We're all drawing off the common, common collaborative work. Now, our version here may not be the one for Texas because they'll have a different foundation and other things. Um, so people can make local forks, and this allows an infinite number of derivatives to be made at the same time. It's a distributed process. So we focus on the idea that you can completely fork it everywhere and distribute the effort for many different versions at the same time. So you don't get into governance conflicts of, of oh, who is the master here? We're, we're letting everybody have autonomy on what they're going to build. The individual in authority is the guy that actually builds it and says, oh, yeah, this works and it's tested. This is legitimate. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I think you can take that uh, method even to um, the the notes, uh, yeah. which I, you know, that 
there's going to be typical notes that work for 80 percent of the places but then yeah. maybe you have a fork that has the california specific notes or the iowa specific notes or yeah. the cold region you know insulated foundation notes or something mm -hmm. um uh and then let everybody refine those to death and then you can just plug and play i think figuring out a way to grab and put on a sheet yeah uh, that's you, you got to sort that out um yep. but if you've got a good system to do that um i i think that would be rad you know yeah I mean, it, the system is I mean, be, yeah you know 50 60 percent of your set you should be able to already have done you know mm -hmm. um and more if you're using a standard model um I, in terms of the building um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see people, I bet you're going to want to, in reality, I bet people are going to, they're going to want to customize a lot, if I had to guess. Like, oh, can I get a this? Or I've got a funny shaped site, how about I add on in the back? So um, I think there's always going to be a bit of work, you know, you're never going to quite get it exactly uh, rubber stamped of a building. but. Um, 60% of it you can, you know, you're using the same roof, same foundation, same walls, et cetera. Um, and so the other refinement to get into is how the um, kind of plan check construction set interacts with like your more robust set. Because uh, in reality, you really don't want to show more than you need to in the construction set. Mm -hmm. And the rule of thumb is the more you show, the more they will mark up. Um, you want to show enough that mm -hmm. shows you code compliance. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, I think you're just going to invite a lot of headaches going through plan check if you mm -hmm. give them the whole instruction manual. Yeah. So I think some way of intelligently linking, you know, if I've got a PDF set of the construction plans and I'm looking at detail, if there's, you know, some sort of code or something that links you back to the wiki that is like, hey, this is how to actually install this window. Like, yes, here's the detail that meets the code compliance requirements, but here's the link to actually, you know, go and watch a, you know, clip on how to do it or see an exploded three-dimensional diagram of the flashing and whatever that might be. Uh -huh. So I think interaction between those two would be really great. Sorry, I'm dreaming, but I, this is this is fun. <laughs> no, that's, that's right. Now, we have to make a distinction between the process. Of, so what we envision during the summer, during the hackathon, is we generate this mat it's it's a publication it's the enterprise manual it tells you about how mm -hmm. to build it here's your how you generate the plans how do you do redesigns and so forth uh, so that'll be a generative document with a good um, like high quality document that's well well organized and graphically well stylized and then from that you will be able to ext like of course each house will be custom right so mm -hmm. you have to have a person uh, which we talked about the the person who's the drafts person or the so-called designer uh, take a look at that and that's the kind of roles we're going to be training for as well so we can execute a bunch of these houses all over the states and so forth uh, but one stage is okay here's our master document like this enterprise manual for how do you not only design a house but also run an enterprise with it and here's the uh, actual house build for specific clients so very distinct phases. Right. Mm -hmm. Downloading FreeCAD now. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, no, it's very, uh, I don't know, I, I really hope this catches on. I think I had talked with you way longer, one of the first times we talked about how um, it's always frustrating in kind of the architectural industry, how everything is locked down and proprietary. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I would never share with another firm our details because, you know, we worked long and hard on those and we're not going to give those up. And, yeah. uh, and so everyone does this. Um, but the world would have better waterproofing and better eaves and things like that if we got over ourselves and just were like, this is the best way to do it. And we're like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Like the open source philosophy is not at all sunk into professional architecture. Um, you know, it's really still very, very fringe. Um, well, not all, there is no single hardware endeavor in which this is firmly grounded, including 3D printing. 3D printing is the best example of open source development, but even there, there are significant limits to, to the true potential. Yeah. Yeah. No. But it's, I mean, you're implying, isn't this obvious? <laughs> right? Right. You know, um, <laughs> what, what I, what I find frustrating is architects talk big talk sometimes about this kind of mm. greater good yeah. designing for the community as yeah. the whole yada yada. Yeah. And honestly, if we, if, if I could easily pick the best foundation yeah. transition detail from rigid insulation to stucco to a foundation in the whole world, this is, this is the That's best it. we got. Mm -hmm. And just on it, I can spend more time designing like good, honest design. Like, Absolutely. I don't think I should necessarily be spending time recreating a detail or a system that somebody down the street did last year better than what I can come up with. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, there's a disconnect between the business end of it and the um, the high food and talk of us architects. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's a, definitely a central theme that we're trying to overcome. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it would be really great to get get this as an example of like, yeah. hey, you know. Um, where I see it just huge is in California where it's so expensive, formatting process is so arduous. Like if you could show, hey, by putting it out there for free, it's better for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and the ADUs know. are a great example of that already. That's, yeah. that's great progress there. That's super encouraging. All those details it, are already there. It really is. So what happened is there's just a huge amount of legislation pushed trying to get more housing in California. There's way too many people in too few houses. And these ADUs are this great kind of backdoor way to build a bunch of units. Um, so you don't need to hire a developer to build 100 units, you just make it a little easier and that neighborhood adds 100 units by itself through incentive, you know, private incentives. Yeah. Um, and so communities got funding grants to basically encourage development. And some of them are using these grants to hire an architect to create standardized ADU plans. Um, so it, it's really great. My company is actually going after a few now, so I might I might have some more for you in the future, um, you know, standard plans like that. Um, but it's very interesting is right now, there's a bunch of people that make a lot of money drafting up ADUs, and now cities are giving them away for free. Uh, and they're, that of course has caused some friction. Oh, but it's like, guys, the, you want to put a little granny flat in your backyard? This is not a custom, you know, you're not building a mansion in Bel Air. Like, you don't need it all custom. You can buy something off the shelf. Like, you're going to put Ikea in it, so why are you getting, you know, Rolls Royce if you're going to put an Ikea inside? So just make it all Ikea. It should be off the shelf. You know? Tell me about the friction that has caused... Uh, so there are drafters um, that specialize in small, I don't want to say easy, but minor projects. So um, for instance, my firm's on the bigger end. We don't really do a lot of ADUs. Sometimes we do it because a client relationship or something, but they're, they're quick, fast, and don't make a lot of money. So they're not really our, something we do. But if you are a small independent, you know, typically one person operation, they're really nice. You, you make a couple thousand dollars drafting them up. It's not very hard, not a lot of liability. 
now, because they're being put up there for free, people are using the free ones, or are at least starting to, and they're out of work. That's the friction. Mm. They're, they're mad because their their livelihood is being taken away by a PDF. Um, mm. Yeah, but it's tough. So that that program Revit I was showing, you know, like we always talk about automation taking out jobs and stuff. That program, I would say, a well trained person in Revit is three to four people well trained in a standard drafting software. And what is your true? What are you comparing it to? What is standard drafting software? AutoCAD. So AutoCAD is kind of industry standard for 2D drafting. Mm. Um, so Autodesk is the company that owns probably 90% of the architecture and engineering software. So um, they do Revit, Inventor, um, 3D AutoCAD, AutoCAD, Architectural Desktop, um, Maya. Just about any of the very expensive higher-end engineering and um, architecture softwares are owned by Autodesk. But their kind of flagship drafting software is AutoCAD. But AutoCAD, it's, it's way better than hand drafting because you can organize it and edit, delete it very fast. But it, for the most part, it is still drawing lines just faster. But going to the 3D world, I basically program a wall type. I say, OK, I want this siding, this level insulation, this sheathing, these studs, this drywall. Then I draw that wall, and it looks like lines on the paper. but it's not, it's a bit of building information. So that has insulation built into it, thermal um, you know, properties, reflectivity on the outside, and it doesn't just draw it in 2D, it, I set the height, how it attaches the top and bottom. So in the 2D world, somebody would have to draw the lines, then said, okay, great floor plan, draw a section, they would have to draw a section a great section, can you draw me an elevation? They would have to draw an elevation. I draw a good floor plan. My sections, elevations, roof plan, they're basically done because I've, I had to put a little more time thinking in the beginning, but it's, it's all there. All I'm now mm -hmm. doing is taking snapshots. Well, I bring that up is the efficiency is skyrocketed. So over the last like 10 years, as people really moved to Revit and this three-dimensional modeling, the amount of um, drafters in architectural firms mm -hmm. has dropped um, because one, it takes more knowledge to use Revit. You got to actually understand a little bit more about building to do things correctly. So somebody with a, you know, a little summer course in drafting after high school typically isn't getting hired anymore. We're looking for people with five, six years of upper level architectural training those tend to be better at Rabbit. But so this program has, in essence, stolen thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs from the architectural industry. You know, mm -hmm. a robot hasn't taken my job, per se, but a program has greatly diminished the amount of people needed to do the same work that it did 10 years ago. Um, so while I feel for these drafters losing their job to a PDF, it's tough out there. Um, same thing is happening to the architects too. You know, this program is eliminating the need for lots of me's out there. Um, and we're not even, we're scratching the surface and the AI stuff coming down the pike is scary. Um, so a lot of like what I do is multifamily residential or you get a site and we try to figure out how many units we can squish in there. Um, for the most part, it's trial and error. It's like, okay, if we have the parking lots this big, how many units can I squish? What if I, Turn it this way, can I squish a few more units in there? Um, well, you know what's way better at doing that than me? A computer. So uh, a huge amount of what I will do now is going to be obsolete, I would say, definitely within 10 years, but maybe within five. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'll talk about it. Uh, it's all changing. It's all changing fast. So, right, so let's talk about positive solutions here. So I think in terms of the automation workflows, I think the answer right there is FreeCAD because mm -hmm. you can write Python scripts 
and you can reprogram it to do whatever you like. So, take your your house 3D model. Say we generate that, okay? Plug in, generate elevations, etc. So basically, break down. Maybe what we want to do is identify the very specific tasks that we need to do, and we can get that programmed up relatively easily. So yep. maybe you can help by uh, guiding that process. I I I definitely want to. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would love to see how that automated, but yeah. for Rust, it's there is a there is a playbook, and if you can program yeah. that playbook in, awesome. Absolutely, um, so let, absolutely. You, know, you model it up, and so like in in Revit, you know, you're kind of manually saying, okay, I want an elevation. So take a picture from this angle. A roof plan is taking a picture, looking down. Mm -hmm, a section mm -hmm. is taking a picture from halfway in it. That, that's all. Yeah. But if you can automate, hey, take these 12 pictures and put them on sheets. That's hours saved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the how we're going to do that, so I mentioned the hackathon. This is the, exactly yeah. what we, we can do in a hackathon like that. We will invite a bunch of programmers and set them up with the, the task set, a task queue of all these individual things. So as we go forward into the future, we, we can, when we whenever we find people, we can start implementing these tasks or save some of that for, for the big hackathon and, and rally around that, as now we're getting really good open source architecture workflows uh, into mm -hmm. the thing. So uh, what is the playbook? So I would say the playbook is that PDF. That's a, that's a great playbook. Um, so um, I can go through it and kind of note up some mm -hmm. things that I'll say are red herrings that you are California specific or things that I just don't think would actually be applicable to the okay. seat home. But in general, um, if you flip through that, you're going to have a site plan. You're going to have a floor plan. Yep. You're going to have elevations. You're going to have a window schedule. You're going to have a door schedule. You're going to have sections. You're going to have a roof plan. You're going to have a ventilation plan. Uh, and then you're going to have details. Then you're going to get into some structural stuff. So you're going to have a foundation plan, a framing plan, framing details. Then for electrical, you're going to have a switch and lighting layout, and an, or uh, they say power layout and a lighting layout. Sometimes you can do them at the same time, but you can have those. Mechanical, not too much for these. Um, you're going to have to show basically your mechanical system and your vents. Mm -hmm. um, so go, those few things, um, that that will get you through it, but. Um, so I have a note document in a Google presentation thing. Can you can you maybe um, use that and start? You, you, you're familiar with Google presentations. Yeah. Can you use that to take more notes and maybe um, use that document right there as a start? Yeah. Can you send it? Send me a link. Yeah, it's in the chat box. Oh. So um, I just took a few notes for today. Um, but yeah, if you can, um, let's do that and see how much we can take. This, this is the existing capacity of FreeCAD, and here's what kind of scripts, and maybe there's macros, or you can have entire workbenches. Yeah. Like, for example, we have designed a workbench to design 3D printers within FreeCAD already. So mm -hmm. we can do that kind of stuff, and almost low-hanging yeah. fruit. Yeah. Um, that, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, that's very exciting. Yeah, no, this okay. is great. This is yeah. great. Let me let me start outlining things um, and go again. Uh, not to not to dodge the bullet. My my free time is uh, yeah. intermittent due to uh, the the toddler and the infant. Um, but this is fun, you know. Yeah. Um, I, um, yeah. Do you think you can scrounge up? Three days. So, so in September, in August, we'll, we'll hold uh -huh. one day around August 18 or so, where we do this uh, 2,000 person hackathon, which is highly coordinated across all the different tasks. It's going to be the, the greatest thing. I'm How planning. many friends do you have? That's a lot of people. That's awesome. Well, the, this is, uh, yeah, that's a, like our next major, major initiative to show okay, we can mm -hmm. actually get a lot of people coordinated around a very important project that produces significant results like okay here's a house model that's okay this is one that you can replicate greatly right. around the world 
Um, so that's an interesting proposition, and, and we're trying to gather people up. And the idea is that we, we select a weekend, and we say, okay, can you commit 24 hours in one weekend, so over Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we get a lot of this, this kind of stuff done. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of what we're, we're aiming for in August yeah. to move forward significantly on this. Yep. Yeah, well, um, send me the invite. Uh, I have no idea what August holds for me, but yeah. Yeah. anything like last few months, I'll be around, not going anywhere. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. That's great. Yeah, as you said, the the idea of you know um, a lot of people getting around a common problem so that everyone can move on to the next thing. Like you mentioned about people being scared about all this automation, but the the real question is, well, what do we are do with our ample spare free time? No, I mean, what do we convert this to? Can we actually start evolving as people and do more meaningful things? Because now we have the time. It's like people are scared of that, but no, we got to create a world where people welcome that kind of a an opportunity. Yeah. I know. I again, my kind of Californian perspective, but man, if I could get a house for fifty thousand dollars, heck, a hundred thousand um, dollars, that would free up immeasurable amounts of my time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would not be working a very stressful, more than full time job right now if I could basically have free housing. Um, and same with my wife, you know, like that would be such a huge advantage. So if people could see some of the payoffs, like, you know, th this really makes a big difference. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, Absolutely. I mean, the yeah. number one, I mean, clearly the number one cost in people's lives, that's housing. Yep. Right. Yeah. That's the... So, no, it's a big deal. And, and I think, uh, I think going international with it too makes a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, obviously things are going to be different in different places. Um, yeah, I've done some like schoolwork stuff in Sub-Saharan Africa. It kills me. They, they don't have lightweight framing there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's expensive and slow and bad. And it's like, oh man, I wish I could just send you a stack of two by fours. Like <laughs> you do so much better. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, opportunities what's sure. to be, yeah I, I think about that sometimes like so what's to be said about places where so simply what they don't have they don't have a lot of lumber there right and yeah. and that's it so you have to work with more local methods do you see any substitutes for that do you see any any game-changing things that could actually address that issue of lightweight framing <sighs> I, I don't know I'm certainly far from an expert the so I was working with this uh, charity called building tomorrow and um, it was right when I was getting out of school and I helped them um, de design kind of a, a standard school model. Mm -hmm. And they were really into um, compressed earth bricks. Oh, yeah. And um, it was this cool thing where they wanted to, um, you know, they try to get sort of like sweat equity from the community. And that was a big thing um, that everybody could press bricks, you know, the kids, the women, everybody could come down and squish a brick machine. And so in theory, was this going to be this great thing? Uh, in practice, the people actually laying the bricks wanted like all the bricks on day one so they could get going. Um, and would much rather just like buy a stack of bricks than these crumbly bricks that showed up some days, some days there wasn't a big pile of bricks ready for them, yada, yada. Um, and the quality was poor. Um, so the, the organization basically said, we're not doing this again. Um, they had to use a lot more mortar because the uh, compressed bricks weren't great. And it was just like, this is dumb. We're buying bricks. It's not that expensive. We're right. okay. Yeah. Um, mm. I, I think this is like tantamount of the, you know, idealism versus reality, and it's just tough sometimes. Um, so it was one example, but I know it, it, it went poorly and it put a bad taste in that charity's mouth for using compressed earth bricks. Um, their, their biggest innovation, though, was not technological at all. 
they got a fundraising pipeline system down pat. So um, they worked with US colleges, basically would create campus clubs. Those campus clubs would turn into these little fundraising machines. And then that campus club would actually get a school of their own. And so it was very satisfying, you know, like I can still look on the website and be like, oh, I did that school, you know. Uh, that was their big thing. It, it wasn't technological. It wasn't, you know, have anything to do with building. They figured out a good system for scalability and fundraising. What organization um, is this? It's called Building Tomorrow. You Google them. Mm -hmm. And I said, guy worked over there, I think, when he was real young. And uh, it's very much like, why? Why are these schools so crappy? <laughs> Uh, and, and the cost to build them is, is laughable. I think it was like $20,000 or something to build a school. Like, you know, in my world, that's a kitchen renovation for one of my clients. Like that's not, you know, much at all. So um, he basically figured out a way to work with um, some kind of local school districts and get it going. Um, but, you know the guys well, from? They're from Indiana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's. So there. I, I, went to, I went to school in Indiana. That's okay. how. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's very interesting and something that we can consider as well as far as a good model of success. Are the, are the schools actually working? I mean, so they can hire teachers and the program is good one or. As far as I know, I. Um, the year after me, some kids from my college group went and they squished some bricks. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as far as I know, it, it is a working model. Um, you can look at, kind of dig in deep, but have I done a, I personally have not done a real thorough uh, deep dive into their system, but they seem to be still moving and shaking. So hmm. um, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, just one thought. It's, I, I, I'm laughing like as you talk about the bricks, but yeah, I, I do understand some of the challenges, and I do believe also that automation is, I think, a good solution to it. Because right now we're doing stick frame housing, but with the the only missing link for us is a, so, a good saw mixer where we can make stabilized block that's got some concrete in there, so they're waterproof. But that's the last machine we're going to have to develop. But we are planning on doing the, the model that we're doing right now, also with sweat equity and bricks as well. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they were uh, doing the cement stabilization. I think mm -hmm. these were true, uh, just compressed. Yep. Um, but you should see the bricks, the, the fired bricks they use are, uh, I would say, not up to uh, uh, ANSI standards in the US for sure. They're, they're crumbly. Um, but but for the most place, these are replacing like tin shack school rooms. So it's they're better than that, you know. Like they're uh, it's are a they still up, are they still using they're they're using the fire bricks right now? That's so I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they'd be interested in some automated brick pressing. I don't know if that would be a work in that context, but it might be interesting. Maybe I. I think the logistics of getting your press out there be a challenge, but they're mostly working in kind of one area of Uganda. So I could see you can get it in the back of a pickup truck. Maybe the company just owns it and drives it around to their different school sites. Yeah. Anyway, something to keep in mind. Yeah. 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 Um, awesome. All right. Well, I, I should be getting back my wife is on double kid duty at the moment. Um, but let me go through, I'll start kind of making some notes and stuff. I think my, where I think I can be most useful, let me kind of outline a, per um, se, a, a standard set. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, set of what you would need. And then um, maybe I can kind of mark up the, the Encinitas set as an example of, you know, these are good notes. Um, and I, I, what I can do is start thinking of it in, in, in modules. Mm -hmm. um, I really, yeah. I think that's going to be very successful. So like, yeah, you're going to want some site notes, site notes can be a module, 
these are standard site notes. Here you go. Yeah, um, almost to the point. Okay, point by point, we can fill in. Okay, this is for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What? Um, I I would like some kind of end in mind of how how this all is physically compiled onto a sheet. Um, so let me play with FreeCAD two to see if there's a way to do that. Um, well, okay. um, yeah. Think about so so Google Docs are the crowd editable version. So if we if we can make it into Google presentations, that means a lot of people can be working on it. We can generate a set like that in rapid time. So it'll be the ideal way to do that. We can still export the PDFs out of um, out of Google Docs. So I think okay. that might be a good solution. Okay, so it would go from a drafting software, say yeah. FreeCAD, to a are you going to have to go to a rasterized image, or? Well, a uh, scalable vector good. graphics from. Uh, okay, so you can export some sort of uh, a scalable vector graphics from FreeCAD. That would be from Inkscape. From uh, the we have a workflow cool. where we go from FreeCAD, and we actually use Inkscape to generate the scalable vector images from FreeCAD drafts. Okay. We have that capacity. And then and then we can put those on a Google. Google, app. yeah, just cut and paste. And if it's if it's got a transparent background and, and it's scalable, um, yeah, that's that's legit. Katrina was doing some uh, documents where she's just putting a a scale. There there's some functionality within Google Docs actually where you can draw a scale up to the document. You can you can just add a scale to it. Um, I don't right. know the details of that. But she was just making, doing that pretty much manually. But um, if you can have people working on that in parallel, that, that can be a quick process as we go in a parallel track of starting to automate some of those features out of FreeCAD. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me play with that little pipeline. See see what I can come up with for yeah. an easy yeah. way. Yeah, and based on your outline, we can say, okay, so here's a task. Like here's how we get a perfect case. Like here's right. the elevations. Here's a script in FreeCAD that gets us that and plops out a few pictures in the correct. That's way. Is there a good open source like task manager? Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's. Um, I'm looking back because that I I live and die by. Um, um, what kind of what kind of stuff? What kind of packages? Like we we like you to use some kind. We did use a Scrum board kind of software where just tasks that are in progress yeah, are done and all of that. Um, there's there's a lot of them out there. Just pick one. Right. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to. Uh, whatever you're doing, I will. I'll fit it. Use whatever you're doing, but. Um, yeah, like we use Microsoft Planner, and it's it's fantastic. I can assign stuff, drag and drop. It's like Trello, basically Microsoft yeah. stole Trello, um, but it's oh, it's great. Um, I can't keep track of all my projects, so I I am in desperate need of these of who's doing what, where it's at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There there is open source alternatives to Trello. Let me paste the link and uh, the the working doc there. So Trello. Open source alts. Uh, take a look at that. There. Yeah. Um, So, so you know my brother Joshua. Um, yep. My mom was looking for this art thing for my dad, and uh, Joshua got her going to Deviant Art, um, uh, which has a lot of awesome resources, but also somewhere where I probably wouldn't send my mom. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of uh, scantily clad fairy women on the covers. Mm. You know, it's an interesting open source resource. There, I didn't see that come through. Um, that would you paste that? I can Google it. I, yeah. I know how to find open source alternatives. Don't worry, it's fine. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's in the doc. It's the second page in the. Okay. Cool. Go, go in there, the first page now. Oh, there we go. Got it. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Okay. Um, very good. Um, well, let's stay in touch. Let me know as things come up. Um, but it's exciting work. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So yeah, thank you yeah. for um, talking. And collaborating on this, it's great. Yeah. So. Uh, we we got to do this now. I, I promised my wife. I you know, it's like yeah, I'm working with this eco house people again. Just like when are we, when are we going to get a house out of this? And I said, give it time. We'll get there. Don't worry. So well, the um, idea is we that the model. Yeah, yeah. the The idea is that uh, the turnkey model, like if we do all the build for a person, they can hire us for 130k. We can do a the thousand square foot house model or you can for about fifty thousand dollars you can build it yourself yep. uh, if you have the time yourself yeah mm -hmm. yeah i gotta get yeah. some land yeah, yeah and a few other things before but you know eventually yeah all right very okay. good well, thank, thank you, you. Mm -hmm. okay yep. take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.